everybody. Um, my name is Sean Queenan, and I am the program manager for the SolarWorlds Community Program at Excel Energy. I'm going to start just by walking you through some of the renewable offerings and uh, kind of footprint that Excel has. So right now we're a leader in the wind energy provider for over a decade. Um, not pictured in this graphic is that we have the most community solar gardens online of any utility in the country. We're over 650 megawatts now between Minnesota and Colorado, uh, along with some in Wisconsin, and we're looking at filing programs in New Mexico as well. Uh, we've recently uh, re we've recently set new goals for a clean energy transition. Uh, these have set marks for both 2030 of 80% uh, reduced carbon emissions and 0% carbon emissions by 2050. Um, so this, was, this is for our whole territory across eight states and uh, applies to the whole company. So it's uh, one of the more progressive and uh, leading kind of sustainable goals that we've put out and we're very proud of it. As I said, we're, we're number one in the wind um, in the country and we've, I think we've had 14 out of 15 years that we've been doing that. So that's been a big backbone of our company for a while. Uh, in addition to what is now kind of the growing solar um, kind of port part of our portfolio. So to talk about uh, community solar, we also have to talk about renewable energy credits. And renewable energy credits are a one megawatt of production from any renewable resource. So in that, you can see uh, whether, powers, whether power is produced from a power plant, from a renewable resource, it goes into the grid, feeds into your home, and then that is recorded as production, marked as a renewable energy credit, and gets uh, the company then, you know, accounts for all our renewable energy credits, and we retire them on behalf of all Excel Energy customers at the end of the year. So we have renewable energy credits um, to meet all sustainability goals, whether state or federal, for the upcoming years, and, and we're still in the business of acquiring them. So to talk a little bit about how the third party community solar model works, um, this is one of the better graphics I have. So the best way to kind of explain it is the solar developer or subscriber organization is going to produce the energy which they will sell to Excel Energy along with the renewable energy credits. We will buy those to, this, to the subscriber organization and we post bill credits on the subscriber's bill. So for folks that sign up, you would be a portion of the garden, maybe you sign up for 5% of Jack's Solar Garden, well, 5% of the monthly production is accounted and accumulated into bill credits and then are applied onto your bill on a monthly basis and you would see those to kind of net against your bill. So for bill credits, we can get into kind of how the calculation goes. This is something that comes from uh, Colorado Rates and Regulations Tariff, so it's something that's in legislation and required by the Public Utilities Commission that we follow. And essentially what you're seeing is you're going to be paying everything minus the transmission cost and transmission cost adjustment. So that's the bill credit that gets applied. So as you guys are probably paying some, somewhere around about 11 cents for a kilowatt hour on a residential rate, we would, be, we would be giving you a 7 cent bill credit, which is the amount it costs us minus that transmission and transmission cost adjustment factor of the bill credit. So as these bill credits are applied, and, and it is dependent on what rate class you are, and we have a number of rate classes that you can kind of qualify for. You can see the different residential ones, and certainly if you're a business or commercial customer, you can sign up for different ones there that, that fit you best. These are applied to your bill, and they'll be used to offset uh, certain charges. So they don't offset service or, f or facilities charges. They don't offset any of your gas charges. They are only applied against your electric charges. So. That's what this table here represents, and um, I should say all this information is posted on our website, so if you go to excelenergy.com slash community, it'll bring you right there, or excelenergy.com slash renewables will bring you to our renewables page that shows all program uh, subpages. So that's the, the overview of the, of the program specifically. I'm actually gonna save questions till the end because there's a lot that uh, both NREL and, and Jack Solar Garden will be covering that uh, you may be wondering. So that's an overview of what the program offers and, and kind of the functionality of it. Um, I should say, 
you know, we've, we've offered the program since 2012 and we have, we're currently serving about 2,500 customers with the expectation of, along with the 85 megawatts that we have online right now, we're on pace to have about 200 in Colorado online by the end of 2021. So uh, we're on pace, for, like I said, we're right now the fourth largest community solar uh, garden offering in the country by state and excels number one overall by utility with when you factor in our Minnesota program. So uh, that's a little overview on, on Excel Energy's part and we go out and acquire projects as solar developers bring them to us and uh, you'll hear a lot about why Jack's project was so unique and uh, became a participant in the program. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to James and, and let him uh, tell you a little bit about NRAIL's involvement. Hi, uh, my name is James McCall, and as I as was mentioned earlier, I'm a, I'm a researcher for the, Str the Strategic Energy <coughs> Analysis Center um, at NREL. And I'm here today to talk about uh, one of our projects that's been sponsored by the Department of Energy, uh, namely the INSPIRE project that is looking at the benefits of co-location of agriculture and solar um, across the country, along with s some other uh, benefits and native pollination and plant kind of benefits. So to kind of go over the INSPIRE project first off, um, it's, it's, it's dealing with a lot of different pillars. And the first one is this kind of like the low impact site preparation. So what can solar developers pass off as these best practices for reducing the Im environmental impacts of solar? Um, and you know, as, as we've seen in the past, traditionally the solar developer would come in, they would kind of grub and grade the soil, they would sterilize it, they would put a mat to kind of prevent vegetation or they might leave it bare, they might do a gravel depending on it. And so we're trying to see if, there, are there benefits of actually installing native vegetation underneath the solar modules to either provide habitat for species or some microclimate benefits underneath the solar panels. Um, the second one is this kind of polyander and native vegetation. So basically kind of what I had mentioned earlier about can you actually provide a habitat for these poll pollination species in particular co-locating them next to agricultural sites that can actually benefit from that. So we've seen um, one of our project partners, Argonne National Labs, has published a paper uh, that basically was looking at the potential benefits of having these farms next to pollinator dependent crops. And so we've seen you know, soybeans, um, almonds, blueberries, et cetera. If they're in that area, there's, there's, there's some benefits for cross-pollination in that area. And the third one is this um, solar, agri solar agricultural co-location, and I'll, I'll go into that more today. So to first kind of start off with, we'll go over kind of what is this, 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 this is actually kind of the, the large scale picture of, of, of this project. And so basically you can provide habitat, habitat for pollinators, you can actually provide shade to crops that, that, that can reduce water stress. And also, uh, we've, we've been seeing some changes in the evapotranspiration, so you actually have some more water kind of actually entrained in the soil. And we're also seeing differences in wind and temperature underneath solar modules. And so we're really trying to quantify those benefits and to see, is there a way to take advantage of this? Um, and we have, as you, as you can see in the bottom right over there, we have a very large project partner, very, very diverse across the country. And then the map kind of shows where we have these initial sites um, all over the map. So our, our most kind of advanced project so far that we've been working with is we had a test site at Boulder in, in, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and then Minnesota is also where we've been doing a lot of this work in terms of the native vegetation. But in terms of the agriculture, we've been working with the University of Massachusetts, the University of Arizona, and also Byron Solar Farm to basically help them design and kind of implement these kind of practices. Um, so as you see on the top left, we, uh, this, is, this, this is actually the test site at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and as you can see, the solar panels are actually lifted very high off the ground. I believe that they're at six feet. Yeah, yes, yeah, six feet. And so they're at that height, so they can actually take a small tractor underneath there. And so what they're growing is these very kind of high value hand harvested crops, so kale, peppers, so on and so forth. And so they've been doing all this collection. So they basically planted the crops, then they harvest them, and they've been doing some analysis in terms of the dry weight and also water content to these crops. Um, along with that effort, we've also been installing some kind of field sensors in, in other locations. 
And we're looking at the uh, areas that I was talking before in terms of water moisture retention, soil carbon retention, temperature, and, and basically any other weather kind of specifics underneath uh, the solar modules. So in this, um, on the left up here is actually our test site at the University of Arizona Biosphere 2. And so they are growing some, uh, they're, they're growing peppers, jalapenos, and tomatoes underneath the solar panels. And as you can see on the right, uh, this paper was actually just public, published recently, I believe in the Journal of Science. Um, and you can actually see the water use efficiency under solar, on, under solar modules increase for, for um, jalapenos and tomatoes. And then you also see kind of fruit production also increase underneath um, solar, solar modules. And so the point of this is that we're trying to see, can you actually create these high value crops underneath solar panels in climates that it wouldn't normally be um, beneficial. And so at the Massachusetts site, we've seen higher yields in hot and dry year, years, but they've seen potentially similar or slightly lower in kind of wet and cold years. So it's kind of depending on the year, it depends on your production. Um, and so we're looking to publish more of these d data points um, soon. And so I think, I believe the University of Massachusetts should be out soon as well. Um, up on the left, um, you can see, we're looking at the native vegetation underneath uh, uh, PV panels. And we've been collecting some water measures um, on the top. And we're seeing actually a, higher, a, a much higher water retention on the top right. So as you can see, the red is actually the, the control site and the blue is actually underneath the solar modules. So we're seeing a higher water retention. Um, and then these pink flags right here, we're also doing pollinator transects underneath these solar modules. And we're, and we're testing different types of seed mixes to see is, do we have the right measure of flowers and grass underneath these solar modules to actually provide these, um, to provide ha uh, habitat for pollinators. And so that's, that work is ongoing and we're looking to publish it next time in a, in a couple years or so. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the bottom right, that's actually a map of we, we basically took every solar site that had been installed in 2017 um, and we drew, a, I believe, a 1.5 kilometer buffer around it and then looked to see how much farmland and how much crop that is pollinator dependent is actually available underneath it. And what we found was that over 860,000 acres of ag agriculture land could potentially benefit if all of these old solar sites were actually converted to pollinator friendly sites. So there's a, there's a fairly massive benefit to both farmers and also um, the local communities. On top of that, we have been partnering with some companies about the uh, producing the solar honey. And so uh, this, this specific company that we've, that we've partnered with in the, in the past is a Bolton Bees, and they actually bring their bee boxes on site, and the bees basically forage in the excess areas around the solar modules where pollination has, has been, um, where pollinator-friendly crops have been grown. And then, so they're basically uh, marketing this as purely solar honey. Um, and, this, and this is actually available for sale and it's very tasty, if, if I do say, say so myself. Um, and it's also been incorporated into something else that everyone loves, which is, which is beer. Um, so, they, so they've been taking uh, a beer up in Minnesota and they've been incorporating the honey into it after the fact. And I believe that that should be available nationwide sometime soon, fingers crossed. So keep an eye out for that. Um, We've also looked at this, uh, the other side of agriculture, which is more on the, um, on the farm animal type. And so what we've been seeing is that, uh, particularly a lot of areas where there's a lot of sheep herds nearby, that you can actually use the sheep to graze underneath the solar modules and, it's, and it prevents you from having to apply herbicides and also a lot of mowing. And so you have these dual benefits of producing either meat or wool, along with reducing the O&M costs on solar modules. Um, one of the large parts of this project is actually reaching out to the local communities. So we are not, our NREL is not an expert in every climate, in every area. We're not even experts in, in agriculture, but kind of our role is to pull together all of these resources, in particular with our land grants and other universities in the area. So most of the times when we go into an area, we will reach out to local university, to other kind of trade groups and rely on that local knowledge. Um, and then after that, uh, a main part of the project is kind of outreach, and that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Um, 
And we are always looking forward to working with new partners. And one of the new partners that we are very excited to work with is Byron with Jack Solar Garden. And I'll let him talk more about that now. What's that? Do you have any slides? No slides. Okay. Is there a way to turn off the monitor? I'll just close it. <laughs> just kick it real hard, something like that. There we go. Thanks, friend. You're good. Well, evening, folks. As he said, my name is Byron Kamenek, the owner of Jack Solar Garden, along with my father. We're planning to put in a 1.2 megawatt solar array just outside of Niwot. By the end of this presentation, I'd like, you to, I'd like to have it impressed upon you that Jack Solar Garden is not your ordinary run-of-the-mill, chain-link, fenced-off, underutilized land of a solar garden. We are not simply provide, uh, producing renewable energy. Hell, the solar panels on your roof can do that. Jack Solar Garden will be making more out of our solar panels, doing more for our community, and uh, being a partner with those of you that uh, decide to subscribe with us. Now, after what I just said, I know what you're thinking. I thought his name was Jack. <laughs> my, my grandfather was Jack. Uh, he purchased my family's farm outside of Niwot, 24 acres of land, uh, back in 1972. Uh, it stayed in my family ever since, and uh, I moved out to the farm in 2016. Uh, I had been serving as a U.S. diplomat in Southern Africa on forestry and wildlife conservation issues and moved back to the United States to live on the farm to see what I can do with the land. During the past, oh, I would say throughout 2017, I was learning more about what we could do with our land. So my grandfather had been doing uh, hay and alfalfa uh, production for the longest time, and the farm tenants thereafter have been doing it up till today. And as I was learning more about the economics of this, I was finding out that, well, we can hay 20 plus acres of land and that still does not pay the cost of utilities plus water plus the, plus the property tax. So I was thinking to myself, how is 24 acres of land in Boulder County not more productive? How, how is it that my family was sinking a little bit of money into this farm on an annual basis just to keep it going? Like, couldn't it be more productive for not just our family, but also for the community? So during that time, I, had a, I, <laughs> I was taking a beekeeping class and uh, made some friends with a fellow that was part of a, a solar company in the area. And he came out to visit the farm and told me about how our, field, our north field was perfect for solar, completely flat, right adjacent to a three-phase line. So I started learning more about community solar and I also learned at the same time that Boulder County's land use department would not allow us to do a community solar garden at that time. And so I, they, they were offering me suggestions of why don't I get into chicken farming, potentially should look at doing a tree farm or maybe a horse ranch or something like that. Th those are things that many of my neighbors are working on and I, I wasn't really interested in getting into competition with them on those aspects. And so I, I kept pressing about the, the solar garden aspect, and I found folks at the land use department very receptive and interested in what we were doing and, and why. So over the course of 2017, I worked with them on helping to update their, uh, their land use code, uh, the solar update that was updated in November of 2018. And that opened up uh, a number of different farms around Boulder County to be able to follow in our footsteps of trying to build a community solar garden that the community can also participate in. During that time, I was also working with Excel Energy to learn more about the Solar Rewards Community Program, uh, how, to, how we would go about doing the interconnection, how we would work with participants that would be subscribers to our solar gar garden. Uh, during this process, there was an RFP that came out in October of 2018, and, and uh, Sean sent me an email around December 1st as I was uh, uh, out on a, on a work trip and found out that we won. 
And so that's what really kicked off Jack Solar Garden because honestly, before that, we weren't really sure that we were going to win. So uh, since December of 2018, we've been full fledged on making Jack Solar Garden uh, an opportunity for the community to get involved in. Now, as I mentioned before, we're not your ordinary community solar garden. And there's reasons why Excel Energy and the Boulder County were interested in working with us on this. So let me tell you. Through partnerships with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Colorado State University, and University of Arizona, those folks are interested in using our land as a test site to learn more about how to grow crops underneath and around the solar panels. As James, called, or as James had mentioned before, this is a process called agrivoltaics, the co-location of the two together. So we're going to have five acres of solar panels. That's 3,200 plus panels on our field. And they're going to be, the researchers will have three acres of that land to, to work with for the foreseeable future. We altered our design to be able to be of assistance to them by putting our panels up at, at the, the tracker height of six feet and also at eight feet high. It's roughly, roughly in there. The panels will be single axis tracking, so we'll be able to get more power per panel than uh, your normal rooftop fixed panel. Uh, the, let's see. Which axis? Uh, east west. Sure. So we'll have those panels at the height, and then the researchers can study growing the same crop underneath at both different heights so that they can take this information and share it with other farmers across Boulder County or along the front range for that part that are interested in doing this co-location and then understanding what types of crops will actually work for the panels that they're going to put on their land. Now, if you did the math, I said five acres of panels, they're going to take three acres. That means there's two acres left. We're working with a, a CSA, a nonprofit CSA out of uh, Denver, that's interested in working with us on creating a CSA, a community supported agriculture project, where we'll be growing food that we can put back into the community. This food or this, this project uh, over the time will be learning from the researchers that are just feet away on the other side of our solar garden of how to implement those procedures and put it onto that two acres of land so that we can be more fruitful with the crops that we're growing. Uh, also, uh, as, as I believe James had mentioned, uh, as we're doing this co-location of all this on five acres of land, 1.2 megawatts, that's going to make us, as, as far as we understand, the largest agrivoltaics project in the country, just down the road, just off of North 95th Street in Ogallala. How many of you all have driven by there before? So about this time next year, you'll be seeing a, a quite a large change. Also, beyond the agrivoltaics aspect, we're going to be working, or we have already started up a collaboration with the Audubon Society of the Rockies. This is a pollinator habitat around the outside of our solar array that we're planning on installing. Audubon Society of the Rockies is already doing some fundraising and working with a, a permaculture design, design person, designer, uh, to come out and figure out how to put in about 1,800 different shrubs, bushes, and trees all along that path that'll be about 25 feet thick running, I think it's around 1,300 feet, 600 feet this side, 700 feet to the east. We will become, as far as they said, the largest habitat hero in, in uh, the state of Colorado. Uh, this habitat will provide for the birds, the bees, and even the people that are walking around on tours on our property. We're planning on putting in various fruiting bushes that will help us out as well as the birds. Um, this this pollinator habitat will also act as a vegetative barrier in between North 95th Street and the solar panels. Further, that 25 foot uh, width of bushes that people would have to walk through if they wanted to get to our solar panels will also act as a fence. So that part of our uh, arrangement with Boulder County is that as long as we stick with the code, then we wouldn't need to have to have a, a fence that would surround our property, just this pollinator habitat. So I mentioned tours briefly. Uh, one, of the, one of the plans for the property is to do uh, educational tours for school kids. Uh, from across the county, bring in Boulder Valley schools, bring in St. Vrain schools, have those kids come out and walk the land and see for themselves how food and energy can be produced on the same land. That's not something that every school kid in the country is going to be able to see. Uh, beyond that, as you can see, I have uh, various pieces of artwork here. I, I think, as most everybody else is, an art lover to a degree. 
And what we want to do is also work with the arts community. See about providing a stipend for having uh, an artist in residence during the summer times to bring out folks to to make them engaged, uh, not just by seeing the agri-voltaics in action on our field, but being able to have uh, a picture or, or some illustration that can help us show what agrivoltaics means to the community. Beyond that, we'll be donating 2% of our electricity to low-income households for 20 years per our arrangement with Excel Energy. This would be roughly 10 households here in Boulder County that would uh, be able to receive uh, free electricity bill credits from us. Um, and finally, the revenue that we're able to generate from this project will go back into our farm. It'll help to rejuvenate the other fields that have also been hay and alfalfa or degraded by some of the cattle that was on the farm over time. So I've already started planting a, a one acre apple orchard. It's about 52 trees. I'm interested in seeing, learning from it over the, the next couple of years and then start expanding it with the revenue that we get across our southern field and bring some animals onto our property. All this said, uh, we're looking to the community to, we're looking to support the community with our program and we're also looking for support from the community for our program. We're looking for subscribers, people that are interested in being part of the community that we're developing on site to sign up, uh, help us with upfront payments to be able to pay for our construction of our solar garden and then reap the benefits of having your electricity bill reduced on a monthly basis for the term that you sign up for, having invitations to come out to our farm on an annual basis for events or tours, and then being a part of the largest agrivoltaics project in the country. We foresee this getting more and more attention. Uh, this past week I had uh, about 50 folks from the land use department come out to the farm as part of the retreat to see how they we're able to assist Jack Solar Garden in getting to the stage that we're at already. Next week, I'll have energy executives from uh, the NREL's um, uh, energy executive program coming out onto our farm to, to learn about what we're doing. I don't even have the thing built yet. So this is just showing that there's interest that's coming out to our farm. And once we are built and once we are showing that agrivoltaics is working on our farm, we'll have even more visitors coming out to understand what we're doing here in the area. Uh, and if any of anybody thinks about the, um, uh, on, the, on the political side of things, uh, if you think about the, the democratic platform of wanting to have a, a Green New Deal in the future, uh, people wanting to have more opportunities for uh, environmental jobs and expanding renewable energy while keeping our farms healthy, ours would be a model for that. Here, here. Thanks. So with that, I guess that's it. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll take the clapping. <laughs> Thank you very much. So if you're interested in be, being a subscriber, helping support us, uh, I have information on the back table there that can um, uh, get you down your way. Main thing is start by emailing me to get that going. Other than that, please help me spread the word. Tell your friends about this. If anybody is at all interested in solar, go out, talk to them. Say, hey, look, I heard this guy talk. Yeah, he might have a little bit of a southern accent, but that's fine. Like, he'll get along with him all right. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Should we open up? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, great work, really exciting, and it's going to be so close. So, um, it sounds like you won the, the one of the projects in the uh, XL RFP, but it also sounds like your project has kind of a lot of extra things to it that other solar gardens might not have had. So, I guess I'm wondering, do you think you were able to win the, the XL RFP because of your price or because of the other amenities, or do you know how that how that decision was made? My my belief on it is because we are a family-owned enterprise. It's my father and I. My mom owns the farm. We're not a, a large solar developer that's coming in. We're definitely more on the boutique side of things. Uh, we do have all these extra co uh, collaborations with uh, NREL, CSU, University of Arizona that all help to pitch in with uh, support for our project, plus all the other amenities that we're adding up. And that's my understanding of why we were of interest to Excel. And when you apply, can I just follow up? 
And when you applied, is there like a set price that they're going to pay per kilowatt hour, or how does that work? We, we do have an arrangement with uh, Excel on that for the renewable energy credits. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Can you I think this is really exciting. Oh, it's oh. very ambitious. Uh, I've been fiddling around with these things for a while in different kinds of ways. There's a guy named Howdy Reichmuth out on the West Coast who uh, gave a talk uh, at a conference, ACAAA, oh, 20 years ago, about how to use desert land effectively and uh, turn the soil into something substantially better. It's useless land and thereby excellent for, for, for solar performance. I'm interested in what happens during the winter time uh, to crops, to the land and all of that. And I'd like to get you to scratch your head a little bit uh, downstream a bit. Uh, about thinking about raising food in the middle of the winter, and that means something that's a variation on a theme of greenhouses. And one might think about the way these uh, gardens of yours might work and how one might, for some little like, bit of an experiment on some subset of this three acres, uh, uh, think about what it would be like to have uh, a greenhouse style of thing that also takes advantage of the proximity of TV systems. Uh, just. Out of the out of the dark. I, I, I love what you're doing. I like your spirit. Uh, I uh, probably sh you probably share my view about the occupant in the White House these days. We don't deal with that here, but uh, hopefully we won't have that to deal with uh, too much longer. Uh, but I I will be emailing you. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, uh, inter interesting idea on the greenhouses. I think uh, um, I had heard a question before about if uh, hoop houses would work underneath the solar panels. Now, I'll, I'll say one thing, and then, James, if you have anything else on it, um, that my understanding is the microclimate that's created underneath the solar panels will help to moderate the temperature, especially in the springtime, so that when there is that cooling coming in, the solar panels can help keep that space in between the ground and the solar panel a little bit warmer, so that in the spring you can start planting a little bit sooner. And then same with uh, on the fall side that it would be able to help keep you growing a little bit later into the fall. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've seen, um, and I don't think we have enough data yet to kind of publish exact numbers, but we have seen a, a at least somewhat noticeable difference underneath solar panels. And during the day, we've seen a reduction in temperature underneath the solar panels compared to kind of bare ground. And then at night, we've seen an increase in the temperature. So the potential, as you mentioned, to kind of actually actually prevent some 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 kind of frost. Um, the other thing that I would mention is that we are partnering with another firm that's doing a, uh, a kind of a solar greenhouse model, and that's they kind of install kind of small kind of patches of of kind of solar modules, and then they use that to heat the greenhouse, and then they also use a red film on that to kind of kind of provide a red shift to kind of make up for the incoming light that a uh, that a, that a crop's like. So it, it is something that we are looking at elsewhere. Um, and yeah, I guess, I guess that's all I have to add, add at that point. Did you have a, I think, I think, I think, I think you had a comment first. I'm just curious, I'm a United Power customer. Is there a way for you to get hooked up with them? <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think that's okay. Uh, we're, as an XL Energy program, we're, we can only offer two XL Energy customers for these. Um, that was my guess. Don't yeah. hurt to ask. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, about the uh, the credits, you have a list of different credits for different rate prices. Why would you do that uh, since this is coming out of a solar farm? So those are what are applied on the customers' bills. So right. different customers that sign up are receiving bill credits um, associated with their rate class, and because the rate class or because the bill credit calculation is is the one I had shown uh, with essentially your your rate minus transmission is is why you have different bill credits because there's different rates. So plants need sun to be able to grow. So I'm I'm still trying to figure out how there's going to be enough solar radiation on the plants for them to grow. Um, yeah, so uh, I would I would highly, highly recommend looking up the science paper by um, uh, Baron Gafford um, at a at a University of of Arizona, and so there's so there should be enough reflective light that it's still going to provide enough light for 
for plants. Um, and we've also seen that if you can, if you can. When you say reflected light, what do you mean? Light that basically reflects off other sources. So, so even if it's in the shade, you, you can still see and there's still some light underneath the module. So, so the plants can still take, it, take, take, take advantage of that. And what, and what we've also seen and what has been published in other kind of areas is that, um, in particular with like leafy green, um, so like spinach or kale or something like that, they actually end up producing much larger leaves to kind of basically in these, in these shade atmospheres, so, so that actually have a smaller, more dense leaf in full sun and then kind of a wider to kind of take advantage of that. So, and some crops really do like shade. Um, and so it's trying to find the right crop for your climate is going to be the biggest one. And I think that's part of the, part of what we're trying to look at is that, you know, is, is, and these, and these panels are also eight, six to eight feet off the ground in these, in these cer 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 certain circumstances. So you're going to have still some light that's actually going to come in. So I have two questions, and the first one I guess is for James and Byron, and that is 1.2 megawatts on three acres sounds like pretty compact Five acres. space in that, Five, but it's what you said, two acres were devoted to, to... Five acres of solar panels, three acres of that for the researchers, two acres of that for... Um, having a small CSA. Okay, so you're putting the 1.2 megawatts on five acres. Correct. Right, okay. So which leads me to my other question. Um, is there any consideration that has to be done in terms of spacing on these arrays to accommodate the agrivoltaic? Or, and do you use the same spacing standards as you would if it were bare land? Um, I think to a certain extent, we don't know. Um, we, we have seen some studies where they do kind of like offsetting, where they remove every second panel or something like that. Um, so there's like a full shade, there's a partial shade, and there's a control at the, at the University of Massachusetts site. Um, we really don't know. And so that's, I think, part of why this is so innovative, and it's awesome that we actually have a chance to do research this, this close to our backyard, is that we really don't know. And that's kind of what this project is trying to answer. And one of our design considerations was the spacing of the rows. And so we have our trackers set at 17 feet. When the panels are fully flat uh, from panel edge to panel edge, will be about 11 feet of space while there's nothing above. So we'll be able to drive a small vehicle in between the rows of panels as well. And especially once they are tilted all in one direction, that gives us a little bit more leeway on one side or the other. I think you said the bottom, bottom of the panel is six foot, so you're going to get morning sun on those crops anyway. Oh, uh, that would be, the bottom of it would be the six foot for the eight foot trackers. Okay. So the, when it's a, like the six foot trackers will be flat at six feet, and then when they tilt, one edge will be four feet and one edge will be eight feet. Yeah. So you're still going to get some morning sun on the, the crops? Correct. Certainly. To a degree, depending on where they are located within the grid, yeah. So is there any work around um, the orientation of the panels? I mean, I know you picked the tracker to go probably from the east to the west, right? To kind of get more of the solar. But say if you pick a west orientation solar installation that you get always get the morning sun and you won't, you won't give them the afternoon heat. Is there any work done around that as far as somewhere else in another location that you could maybe share? Um. I guess I'm, I'm asking yeah. about the difference between the tracker or yeah. just the fix. We, yeah, I mean, like, even, even in Minnesota, we have three sites that are trackers, and we have one site that's fixed. Um, and so we actually have a mixture of sites across the country that are going to be tracking, fixed, and so on and so forth. And particularly, I mean, with fixed, you're generally going to orientate it towards the south um, for the most part, just to kind of try to take advantage of that most, of the, or take advantage of the sun most of the year. Um, so we are looking at that, but we don't have anything to kind of sh share about that yet. Yes, sir. No, there's new technology has been offered for quite a few years now where there's photovoltaics and, and glazing for office use. Is, are different types of, of uh, solar panels being considered for this test site, or is it all one type? Here it'll be all one type on ours. Well, who can talk about it? Fair. Um, at d different levels of transparency for the uh, for the panels also vary the cost of it. I know at CSU, uh, just outside Fort Collins, they're, they're doing a, an agrivoltaics project where they're looking at, uh, I believe, fully opaque, bifacial, and then mainly transparent, something like 
something like that. And so they're testing the difference between those three different panels on conducting agrivoltaics. But my understanding of the, the closer you get towards bifacial, you're, uh, I, I, the number that I remember it was, seemed like it was doubling the price of uh, the solar panels. Yeah. Yes, sir. As far as subscribing, is it subscribing through Excel? or through Jack Solar Garden, and you have to be in Boulder County, or is it any Excel customer anywhere? Well, subscribing through both. You start with me, and then w once we get our agreement signed, then we sign an agreement with Excel, and so that they understand what's going on, and then you'll be getting uh, bill credits once they're up and rolling. As far as where you're located, uh, Boulder County is our, our main target, target audience, since you guys are my neighbors. And then next, we could also go to adjacent counties. So uh, Jefferson County would also be of, uh, of interest in Grand, Gilpin, Weld, Larimer, Broomfield, as long as you're on Excel power. Denver? Not yet. So are the, the rates correlated to the distance you are from the source? Mm. No. But you said that the rates change according to the transmission lines. No. The, the, the transmission cost of the um, rate that you're charged is, is subtracted from what your bill credit will be. And the rates do change every year and they will change in parallel. Uh, or I should say the bill credits change every year in parallel with the rates. Yeah, Steve. Uh, you might want to mention the, the, the output of panel in kilowatts and what your expected output is for you based on the, the access, the single access tracking. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so our, our friends at uh, the NREL provided us with a, a SAM analysis of our site based on our engineering designs, uh, showing that our entire system, uh, it was a, a, a nice bell curve of how much power could be uh, produced over time from our grid. And it averaged out to roughly uh, just over 2.5 gigawatt hours a year that our, our uh, solar array would be able to produce. If you boil that down to the number of panels, we have 3, we're planning on 3,276. The, that's roughly 775 kilowatt hours per panel per year. Yes, sir. So um, on the, the credits, do those change? It's, it's my understanding, don't the energy, is it ECA, the, those energy charges change? more often than once a year, don't they? And, and are those at all reflected in the rates? So it's, it's just based on your base rate. So those ECA charges aren't factored in. That's, that's part of what you pay on your bill, but it's not directly correlated to your electric use. If that makes sense. So those aren't, gonna, th th those aren't gonna be directly tied. So they're not per kilowatt hour. Correct. So would it be like buying wind <clears throat> Uh, it's similar to, yeah, wind source is a little different because you buy chunks at a time. So you buy 100 kilowatt hours to exhaust them and then you buy them again. Um, this is going to be more based on your production will uh, be monthly based and then, and then apply to your bill. So it's, it's a little different. It's like the, it's, it's closer to if you had put pan, instead of you putting panels on your roof, you're, you're buying a couple panels from, uh, from Jack Solar Garden. And thinking on being closer to the the wind turbines that people would be able would be subscribing into are further away than where Jack Solar Garden is. One of the thoughts um, I've been sharing with folks is that if Boulder County is to be self sufficient in the future, sustainable with its uh, power production, we need to figure out how to have all of our power produced here, and then also how do we get all of our food produced here? Here, here. So this steps a bit away from the solar panels, but with your solar garden, with the garden portion, the plants, have you considered inoculation with certain fungus species? With, oh, friend, that speaks to my heart. <laughs> yeah, with uh, mycorrhizal species, or the, I know Rishi helps with like, act as an antibiotic for honeybees. Or... So, uh, in my part time, I grow gourmet mushrooms, uh, namely oyster, because they're the easiest to do. Um, I am planning to put in a, a grant to USDA this this fall to see if uh, we can't get some funds to learn how to grow uh, mushrooms underneath the solar panels. 
since there would be a portion that would get the least amount of light at the, at, underneath of it, we can inoculate logs, put them right next to the post of it, and uh, see if in the future we would be able to have little pickings of whenever the mushrooms are flushing, then have people out, pull out their mushrooms. Um, and one, one of the reasons why some people might be like, okay, why, why, why does he want to do mushrooms underneath solar panels? That doesn't seem to make sense on the front range. I, I have a, on the backside of my barn, I've inoculated some logs that are fruiting for me on uh, maybe twice a year. Uh, so that's just outside. That's not with any control, controlled little climate right there. Uh, it's on the north side of a barn. If we put them underneath the solar panels, the panels will be helping to trap more humidity while also shading them. And so more humidity is the type of environment that the mushrooms fruit best in. Yeah. Have you done any um, evaluate on this is kind of off topic, but evaluations of the utility of this versus filling up all of say boulders, rooftops, uh, not just the houses, but larger scale rooftop. Oh, oh. Go take and, that one. You know, so through not the utility of that because there's less transmission into this farm. Um, and, and certainly you can have a whole diverse array of how you're sourcing your solar. But I just wonder about the cost of that versus rooftop is more, I know. But <coughs> but um, schools, rec centers, buildings, commercial, all of that um, compared to this, so, including the transmission. During, our, during the solar code update with the land use department, um, one of their workers uh, did an analysis of Boulder County and all the rooftops. And even if we coated every single roof with solar panels in, in the county, we would still not produce enough power to satisfy the demand here in Boulder County. So we do need to figure out how to have solar panels on land, and then what are we gonna do with the land underneath of it if the solar panels are there? I remember from CU, the students, what was that megawatts that they had? From the map. 600? From the map. Well, it was 600 odd megawatts, my memory from the, the rooftops in Boulder. Right? And our demand is 380 or? But it's, it's not, megawatt of solar doesn't compare to a megawatt of our demand. Because oh. we don't have 100% capacity factor. And this is also for the entirety of the county. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I apologize that you were late, so if you've already answered this, then I'll be embarrassed. Um, uh, one, I'm wondering what the, the payment is on cents per kilowatt hour. And two, I'm just so excited about this because I've loved solar and I love what it's done in the land. And so I was, if I missed, I would love to hear just a little bit about how this, in a sense, movement got started. To, it used to be like, oh, we got to put solar, we got to have, you know, scorcher. Is what the fire and stuff. So I've had a, somebody's thinking changed along the way. So I'm curious about that. So cents per kilowatt hour, maybe for, for for Jack Solar Garden specifically. Jack Solar Garden. Yeah, if I buy a panel and I get 725 kilowatt hours in a year, how much are you going to pay me per kilowatt hour? Is that how it's going to be determined? Yes, yeah, so you'll receive bill credits based on on your rate class. So right now, if you're a residential rate class, I think it's about 7.3 or 7.03 cents per kilowatt hours the bill credit posted. And those are the, those are what change annually. So it will be updated, but you'll be paid out at that. And is that credit, is that like a rec? Is that a renewable energy credit payment or is it? it nope, it's, so it's a bill credit on your bill that would offset uh, electric charges. Okay. So you'd see it just as a, as a as a monetary credit. And is it a rec too? Is it a renewable energy credit? The, so the recs produced from the garden are bought by Excel and then retired on behalf of all Excel and Excel customers. But would you pay me for my rents? If I, I mean, if I got a panel, I'm already in other solar panels. Uh, um, so we do have a we have a solar roads program, and that's for if you put solar on your roof uh, to help um, kind of uh, curb some of the costs. We do buy recs for production based on that. So you are folks are able to put solar on their roof through Excel Energy either through our net metering only program, which means you just get a net meter, and then you can keep all your own recs and get all the renewable energy claims or you can put install solar on your house and um, sell it to us through the solar rewards program. And, and the rec credits are, are fixed based on, there's different tiers of that program and, and those change uh, with every renewable energy plan. So there, there's there's a lot of factors to it depending on when you build it. And apologies, is there gonna be a rec with the, if I would get 10 panels or whatever and Jack's 
Would I also get a rent payment? Or just you will not. Okay, thank you. And uh, along the payment side, uh, Jack Solar Garden does sell the panels more at a premium, but that's because our panels are also going to be doing a lot more than any other panel in the county. So for every panel that you put on your rooftop, you can have that on our, on our farm, and it'll also be helping to produce food. They'll be teaching kids. They'll be helping out with keeping more moisture in our soils um, and helping to teach other farmers across the front range how they could be doing what we're doing and so that they can have a baseline revenue from solar and then also continue doing their agriculture work. So I think what you guys are doing is just exceptional. It's, it's, it's so exciting, I think, with, I mean, like you were saying, with what being able to grow crops underneath and what you guys are working on here. I am curious. So uh, my wife and I just put solar on our house about a year ago, but we are working to electrify our house. So we're trying to get off gas, put in a mini split and all these things. We're looking at getting another electric car and those types of things. So we know that our energy bills are going to be going up and we had been planning that eventually we'd need to put more solar onto our house to offset our continued electricity use, but I'm curious with um, how this works, we have a net meter right now, would we be able to also tap into a solar farm as we increase our electricity use into the future? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you can uh, participate uh, in as many Excel Energy Renewable programs as you choose, up to 120% of your usage. So, uh, you know, right now you're offsetting 100%, but you're adding 30% more load, you could use that to offset, uh, whether it be through Jack Solar Garden or, or another renewable offering, but yep. Absolutely, yeah. We have we have folks that are on, you know, three and four programs, which is pretty cool. And if uh, you happen to move after that and you want to go to a, find a, a new larger home, your your uh, subscription with Jack Solar Garden or or any other community solar garden could move with you. So it doesn't have to be stationary. Um, you move somewhere else in Boulder County, as long as you're on the Excel grid, it'll follow you. You move down to Jefferson County, you want to go hang out in Golden with NREL, uh, that will that subscription will follow you. Uh, what sort of outreach have you done with the local farmers and how are, your, how are the neighboring farms feeling about this giant solar array going in? Haven't done a whole lot of outreach with the farms in the area because we don't have a ton to show them at the moment. We have more theories, vision, and ideas on that part. As far as the neighbors, it was part of our special land use review process that uh, Boulder County sent out uh, notifications to over 40 homes in the area around our farm. Uh, they all had an opportunity to provide input and same with uh, uh, the entire community of Boulder County could provide input. And we received two of our neighbors um, were not overly pleased that it was gonna go in there. And we had about 20 others that were very interested in our project occurring on our farm. And then after more conversations with those two individuals, uh, we were able to come to an understanding. Yes, sir. So to help better manage grid load, um, Probably not in the near term, but future, I presume you're going to look at some on-site storage. Uh, not at present. All of our power goes into Excel Grid. Um, that, that's part of our arrangement with them. That's, what about the other half of the day? What's that? The other half of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so that, you know, just a, a little larger picture. We are um, we're piloting a program that's going to be for community solar with. Uh, batteries, so we're looking at doing that. I think uh, it's in a very early stage of kind of development right now, but that's going to be most useful certainly in more of an urban area where uh, demand's higher. So I think if we see something like that come to fruition, it would be um, likely in a, in a higher demand area than um, where Jack Solar Garden is located. So I'm sorry if I misunderstood this, but you made a comment about other solar farms in the county. Can you describe how they're different, or were you saying that there are there have been no other solar farms in the county? There are a couple other community solar gardens that are just outside Boulder, um, and then I know Grid Alternatives is building one. But my understanding is that uh, all of their subscriptions are basically accounted for, uh, and my understanding too is that we are the only one in the county that's currently selling uh, subscriptions. Is that about fair? That, that's pretty fair, yeah. I, you know, on, on a kind of high level, um, we have a number of gardens that were early into the program, 2013, 2014, and those have had their subscriptions uh, sold out for a number of years. So this would be uh, certainly a new addition into that. And we'll, we'll also only have a number of 
a certain number of subscribers that we can take. We only have a certain amount of power that will produce a certain number of panels. So once we're at capacity, we can't add capacity. Would you yes, sir. When are you going to be on the air? Uh, we're hoping for in uh, start construction in March. And end it. Two months later. <laughs> That's about how long uh, uh, how long we hear that it should take. Yeah. So you need to be fully subscribed to be able to set this up, or no? Um, we have about fifteen percent of our res uh, panels already reserved. Uh, we need another thirty forty percent. Um, of more subscriptions to make sure that we are gung ho and able to pay off construction. So you all can certainly help me out with that by <laughs> shooting me an email, sending me your interest, and helping to spread the word about what we're doing. Uh, I I find that a lot of folks are interested in the work that we're doing. Um, I, I simply push you to take action. If you want to see this kind of project happen in Boulder County, you want to support this, you want to be part of our community. If, if you don't, if you're not able to become a subscriber to us, help, help us find other folks that can. That would be much appreciated. <coughs> yeah. Would you consider um, selling or getting this project done through Longmont? You've got, you're at 95th and? 95th and Ogallala. Ogallala, oh, yeah, that's yeah. funny. And a good name. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's so, a good place to have a farm. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're surrounded by open space land, which is nice, but Longmont is on its own power grid, and so we're unable to service them. So did they, were you interested in having them buy from you? You're closer, like, they're in, like, and they're a, a municipality, owned. they're not a big corporate. Fully understand. I, I wish we could. They are simply on a different power grid than Excel. So we can only sell to uh, Excel subscribers. Longmont has its... Uh, yeah. Platte River. Platte River. Yeah, it's, the, the, the garden's in Excel energy territory, so there's um, other utilities can't service there. Um, I'll also say that uh, we have different events that come up on a regular basis around Jack Solar Garden. So every other Sunday, I put on a little farm tour around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The next one is on September 22nd, which happens to be my birthday, so I might have some cake out there if you show up. Um, also, this Sunday uh, is electric vehicle uh, fair out at Boulder County Fairgrounds. Uh, I'll have a booth out there. Feel free to come out and have a chat with me. Uh, I know Steve will be talking for, you said two minutes or 30 seconds? I couldn't, so, so, something along those lines. So Steve will be out there. Okay, great. So that's another opportunity to engage with us. Um, uh, we'll be doing more speaking events over time. If you have a group that you would like me to come talk to, an HOA, um, anybody else, I, I love talking to people. I'll, I'll shake hands all day long. It's fun. So uh, feel free to invite me out, contact me. We'll take a look at your uh, previous year of electricity usage. We'll sign you up and we'll get this thing done. Thanks guys. Hey, thanks for coming out again.